So it's round four of the 2021 Caterham Academy Championships, and this one's going to be good. Not only is it being held on the famous Silverstone Grand Prix circuit, but also for the first and only time this season, we've got the white and green group on track together, meaning nearly 50 cars lining up on the grid. A typical British summer's day meant unpredicted showers, where it's fair to say my tyre choice, gambling on low tread tyres for a dry session, didn't quite go according to plan. So a very wet track, no tyre tread, together with some really dubious wet weather lines meant I qualified well down in 14th place overall, but I had to start from the 10th row of the grid, 19th place overall, due to the way that Caterham has split the whites and greens down opposite sides. And to make matters even worse, I missed the chequered flag on the final lap of qualifying and embarrassingly have ended up with three points on my racing license for carrying on. What an absolute muppet. Paul, Paul, after that qualifying, I don't think you should be looking so tall. Come on, down, back, down to earth, back, right, down to earth. That's better. What were you doing? Obviously, I went for a silly gamble. I went for a dry tyres, a dry setup, really low profile. So, so there was a huge downfall of rain about half an hour before qualifying, and you went for a dry tyre setup. You mean these tyres here with hardly any tread left at all? Yeah. Probably the only one that went for that setup. <laughs> so it would have been spectacular had the sun been out like this and the track be dry like this, but sadly it was the complete opposite. It was 10th fastest green, which means because it's row by row whites and greens, you're going to be 19th on the grid. So on the 10th row of the grid? Yes. I'm going to put wet tyres on, probably. Well, I don't know if it's like this, I'm not going to do that. I don't know. Help me out. I'm confused. I'll, I'll just be watching. <laughs> I'll give you top 10 minimum. So where am I going to finish? I don't care. I've got to be in the top 10. Leave them alone now. But just think about it, will you, a bit more? Yeah, Concentrate a bit harder. Mark, a bit of the sort of surprise of the day. Second fastest in the green group. You're you the, you the, the slow burner. What's your best result so far? Fourth at Mallory so far in the dry. It's the first driving in the wet today. So hopefully I'll continue to do that and it'll be wet this afternoon. Jeff, a blistery lap time at Silverstone this morning in the very, very wet conditions. What was the secret of that lap time? Uh, I've got absolutely no idea, to be honest with you. I just found myself away by myself. I didn't really have a toe, didn't really have anyone to, uh, to feed off. So I just did what made sense to me, which was to stay off the racing line. And that seemed to pay dividends. So, yeah, just really good fortune. Mike, you're one of, what, six Mancunian mates that have all joined the academy together. When did you start hatching this plan? It was a very, very kind of uh, last-minute decision. I think um, we've done a few track days over the last couple of years in touring cars, and, um, and Simon, who's just behind me over there, uh, went and saw a dealer, and within 24 hours we'd, we'd bought six cars and um, signed up for a midlife crisis. <laughs> so who's winning the Manchester Championship so far? Uh, Richard, Richard Ainsco. He's uh, super smooth, uh, great in the wet. Uh, and yeah, super consistent. Are you all in the same white or green group? Uh, we're all in the white group, yeah, they put us all together. So uh, we've been trying to get a wager on it on it for you know our own little competition. And your, your personal position at the moment of these six? Probably second or third. I'm, I'm Mr. Erratic. I think uh, the commentator at Knock Hill called me Mad Mike because I was a bit flamboyant. Uh, so the, the wet doesn't really suit me. I didn't finish at Mallory and uh, yeah, didn't have a great qualifier today either. William leading the white group of the championship, second fastest white in the qualifier at Silverstone. Was that down to your great win at Mallory in the wet? You were the, are you the rain master? Uh, I don't know, it's probably too early to say, but, um, but yeah, I sort of think I'm doing all right in the wet. So hopefully try and keep it that way. <laughs> It's funny as the year's developing, different people start to become contenders, don't they? Some are slower starters, you've got them running really quickly to lead the championship. Are you, are you worried they're going to start catching you a bit more often? No, it's, it's already happening. I mean, I'm, I haven't quite got, quite got my head around Silverstone in the dry and, you know, there's guys coming in quite a bit quicker than me. So, for sure, hot on my heels, big time. Charlie Lower, looking to go a bit 
higher. Oh no, that's an awful joke. And that's terrible. <laughs> you won at Kerbera, you know, and you, you marry you're on the pace. So you had a bit of a rough time in Knock Hill. Yeah, a little bit of a rough time. But um, yeah, I had a big incident in first corner. I qualified joint third by the same 100th of a second. So then I started in fourth, the guy started in third, and I thought I'd drag race him into the first corner. But he had the same idea too. <laughs> so it didn't work. Now, of course, Charlie, I mean, we met before. You're a stunt driver and stuff. And I've, you know, people see me sliding around on telly and say, well, that's no way to be a racing driver. And it, it can be a problem if you're used to stuff. You have to actually slide less to go faster. Have you found that yourself? Yeah, definitely, 100%. And it's being less aggressive. All the stunt stuff we do is high aggression at low speed. So it's looking, it's trying to make something look as flash and as fast as possible with whilst going. Slow. See, that's why I do it on telly. You see, I, I, I do it like that. That's why we, we, we know how to drive properly anyways, don't we, John? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's then just like dialing it in and actually understeer is a bit faster than oversteer, unfortunately. I know that, I know. It's, it's so disappointing, isn't it? We have to go fast. You can't be spectacular. Definitely. Uh, James, I, I'm so, I know you're watching the Grand Prix. I, I'm sorry, everybody, but, but it's not started yet. It's not. James, you're third on the grid, tricky Silverstone. You know, you're moving up the pack now. Best result, fourth, was it at Mallory? So now, a win today? Fingers crossed. That's the plan. But um, considering my test, I'm a lot happy with my grid position today. So the rain seemed to help. So I'm slightly praying for some more rain this afternoon. You got a bit pushed back by the white group sort of getting in the way a bit. A bit annoying, or are you happy with that? Um, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't annoyed by it, but... Because um, you were like, what, fifth fastest, but you're going to line up eighth or ninth, is it? Fourth overall, um, but yeah, I'm sort of P6 or 7 on the grid, so a little bit annoying, but same for everybody. So, a few hours later, it was time for our formation lap and to get ready for this 20-minute race, and thankfully, this time, it was dry. So as the 50 Caterhams head out for their race, the track is now bone dry, but there are some rather nasty black clouds in the distance. We just hope Paul has picked the right tyres this time. He actually qualified 14th fastest overall, but for some strange reason, they've split the grid in half with the green group on one side, the white group on the other, which has put him down into 19th place. I'm hoping top 10 at least. Come on, Paul, where are you? Where are you, Paul? There you are, he's waving. Oh no, stop waving, he's waving. Why does he wave at everybody? This is his trouble, I've told him to concentrate. Waving. Lining up on pole position was Jeff Newman from the Green Group, with Gareth Lucas second, leading the white side of the grid. Mark Kendall slots into third on the grid, and fourth on the grid is William James, who interestingly would have qualified well down in eighth place overall if it wasn't for the green and white split. Then on the third row of the grid, we have James Cook for the greens and Charlie Lower for the whites. All I could hope for was another good start and at least have a chance of getting through some of this packed field to get back into the mix. It was time for Lights Out. Another great start, what a shame these aren't drag races, but Four places made before we even hit the first corner. Giles Perry got a little spin on and I managed to hold off a bit of stiff competition from Oliver Hardick on the outside and I was up to P14. It was a dream start and so far so good, but with a whole host of cars in front, I knew it was going to be no easy task getting through this lot. Fred Chinnicks ran wide at Chapel, opening the door for me to move up into P13. And despite some real pressure from Fred, I managed to keep position all the way up the hangar straight. Caterham racing is such an intense affair and with Richard Ainscroft and James Moon scrapping it around around Vale, it was late on the brakes and another couple of positions made. With a good exit, I even managed to nip past Tom Minty Noakes and get up to 10th place. Quite a bit of curb on the exit of club, trying to listen to my mentor Tiff and onto the Hamilton Strait. And actually that curb, we'll be seeing that a little bit later in the video.
So by the time I reached village on the first lap, I was really surprised to be in touching distance of the main pack, who were all busy scrapping it out around the loop and entry. So for me, it was all about a good exit at entry to get the toes down the Wellington Strait, which I fluffed monumentally, poking around the completely wrong side of Harry George, who, by the way, he's 22 years old and not 17, as we were incorrectly informed on our previous video. So all that brilliant momentum was slightly paused as the pack approached Brooklands for the first time, but still, if you said I was going to make nine places on the first lap, I would have taken that all day long. We can hear loads of tyres squealing from the complex, but now towards the end of the first lap, here they come, like the charge of the light brigade. Caterham's everywhere. He's 10th, he's 10th. He's got from 19th to 10th. Oh, Paul, come on. No, he's in the gravel. Oh, he was a bit, but now he's out again. A couple of wheels on the gravel on the exit of Woodcote. I'm trying to take a bit more curb and be a bit more aggressive, listening to what Tiff's trying to tell me. And then I don't know why I do this, but a ridiculous vanity wave to my girlfriend, Katie, who was watching from the BRDC with Tiff. Really, I need to stop these hand gestures, but I guess it's a little bit better than the one I did at Knock Hill, at least. Coming up to Beckett's on lap two, where I'm back in touch and distance with the main pack. And a really good exit onto the hangar straight, and what looks like some brave late braking, but actually picking up place on Harry, George and James Cook. But then coming into Stowe, there was a yellow flag, so I gave the position back to James, but with a lot of very confusing hand waving. I think I confused myself more than the other drivers. green flag and it was racing again. Hot on James's heels, good through Abbey and really good out of farm made the move on Village quite an easy one. Well it should have been an easy one but I stuck into second for some extra engine braking as I thought I was going to overshoot the corner and I ended up sliding around a little bit. I never seem to make things easy as the other guys. He's got his lights on, he's kissing the gravel, he's up to seventh, waving, shouting. Hopefully he can catch the six ahead and uh, who knows where he can get to. Then like a scolded cat, Fred Chillicks passed me on the start of lap three to push me back down to eighth position. really nasty lunge at the loop on poor old Mark Kendall who's doing brilliant in the championship and also did brilliantly to avoid me. Thanks Mark, I owe you a beer. And then the most amazing battle down the Wellington Strait side by side, both hanging onto Freddie's toe where I managed to hold position on the inside coming into Brooklands. A clean exit and both hands firmly on the wheel with no vanity waves this time as things were really starting to hot up. So Jeff Newman has made the break somehow. He's broken the toe, but the pack behind with Paul again kicking up dust. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The spinners out on the track there recovering. It's all going everywhere. A couple of cars running wide coming out of cops, including Gareth Lucas, who also then ran off track at Maggots, rejoining the pack just in front. to P7 with the fast boy, so it wasn't just about overtaking, but also defending. And at the end of Hangar Straight, Mark Kendall gets in the tow and puts a move down the outside. This was just such brilliant wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing, and it felt so safe, no unpredictable swerving or silly moves, nothing but big respect to Mark, whose driving I had every confidence in. Another great exit at Farm, and for a change it was easy pickings up the inside of Ian Harris, and it was up to P6 overall. 
as we've said so many times, it's so important to get your corner exit right so you take maximum speed and momentum down the straights. And here at Silverstone in an academy car is probably one of the key things to perfect. Coming into Brooklyn's in a good move just ahead by Gareth down the inside and the cars around him give him plenty of room to make sure he could stay on that racing line. Those toes just make such a huge difference in these cars and it really helped me put him in a good position coming up to Cops, where Gareth Lucas ran wide again, so I managed to nip in front of him and at the same time pass Charlie Lower, who also ran slightly wide. So from P19 to P4, and with second and third place just in front, was this finally going to be my podium day? The answer was a resounding no. And this is where things really started to go downhill fast. In my wisdom, I was trying to get Fred and Mark to work together to catch the leader, Jeff. So I tried waving my hands around as if they'll get the signal. And then I ran massively wide at Beckett's, scrubbed up all my speed at Chapel, and then was overtaken by three cars, four a breadth, up a hangar straight. All I could do was put my head down in shame. So instead of staying with a breakaway pack of Fred and Mark, I dropped back into the chasing pack. And trust me, I'll never ever do this silly hand waving ever again. Then it was the last of the late breakers where Charlie Lowe was so lucky not to take out Mark and Fred, completely missing the corner. Meanwhile, Gareth Lucas also missed his braking and blocked me from turning in. And then I just managed to avoid Charlie Lowe rejoining the track. It was non stop racing action. And really, there's just no point in whites racing greens and vice versa. Although we're sharing a track together, we're in completely different championships. That didn't seem to stop everybody having a real go at trying to get that overall position. Another nice corner, the loop, and that all-important exit down the Wellington Strait, where I managed a much more respectful move on Mark Kendall up the inside of Brooklyn's. But as with all Caton races, this is topsy turvy stuff, and Mark then did the move on me at Croft, only to have the move done by me again coming into Maggots. It was all getting a bit too much. And then those silly hand signals about working together again. I promise that no future race will they ever see the light of day again. After five previous laps of curb abuse, all within track limits, I hasten to add, it was one too many and my camera took a knock. So on what was going to be our penultimate lap, Ian Harris left the door open at Village, slots me back up to fifth place overall behind Gareth Lucas, where the positions would remain as we headed down the Wellington Strait up towards Brooklyn's. Gareth turned into the corner nice and early on the defensive line and shut the door on any potential move. So I took the corner on the standard racing line just ahead of Ian Harris and Charlie Lower, who were also on the standard racing line directly behind me. Then Gareth seemed to outbreak himself, ran wide, completely missed the apex, and I successfully slowed down for the corner, which Gareth then tried to recover by turning directly back into me and causing a collision, effectively ruining my race again. I was absolutely gutted. I just couldn't believe what had just happened. It will never cease to amaze me why the race leader of the white group would be so reckless to try and block another car that's in a completely different championship. The mind really does boggle. <sighs> so, race over. It was time to calm down a little bit, count to 10, and to catch up with Tiff in part Fermi. Paul has blew on that wheel. You're a mud guard missing. What a fantastic race. You were going for fourth and it, it got so busy. He's not in my group. He's not even in my group. And I could see them. He was weaving, stopping everybody going past. And I thought, well, look, you know, that's fair enough. 
just do my own thing. And then, you know, he went, he ran wide, I went up the inside, and then just went straight back over again. But it's, look, it's easy to say that now, heat of the moment, I'll review my footage, I'll do it amicably. But I was, That's a good idea, I think, Paul. That's a good idea. But look, I, you know, I was, I, I had a fantastic race up until that moment. And then it kind of went a bit We'll dirty. just use that bit, not the first bit, all right? Just, we had a fantastic race until that moment. That's probably the best bit, Paul, to sum it up. <laughs> And one of the wonderful things about catering racing, you can tell by the buzz and the hum how much all these people that never raced before this year have had the most amazing experience around the Silverstone Grand Prix circuit. They'll all be blaming someone else for whatever went wrong, but they've all had a great day. And that's what Catering Academy is all about. Jeff, back to the uh, top step of the podium. An amazing yeah. breakaway. You were, you were just in a bundle. Then suddenly you came around about four seconds clear. How did you manage to make that break? Yeah, so I, to, to be honest, I really don't know. It just so happened I was in the flow, just absolutely going for it. Maybe they got caught up, I don't know, having a little bit of battle. So you must have looked in your mirrors and thought, whoa, lucky days. I did, yeah. yeah I think that Charlie made a small error going into Brooklyn, uh, just overcooking it slightly. And as a consequence, I was just able to pull away. At the end of the day, like most racing, it's who makes the fewest mistakes tends to win. So uh, thanks to everyone and the marshals for making it a great day. It's fantastic. Well done. Great. Thanks for your Cheers. All the best. Cheers. Cheers. Harry George, you didn't make my pre-race interviews because you're only fourth. And I said I'd interview if you won. Yes. But you finished second, but you've had a great day. Where did you finish overall? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's that hectic <laughs> catering racing. He doesn't even know where you finished. But you had a wonderful race around the Grand Prix circuit. That's the main thing. Yes. Yeah. I mean, um, I got a good start. Um, uh, I, I was trying to stay with the lead pack, um, but I just spent the whole time fighting, and <laughs> the lead pack dropped us. Um, and yeah, I was just swapping positions all the time from the toe. Um, but yeah, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Caterham racing, you enjoy it, that's the main thing. Yeah, 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 still happy with the second place, I can't complain. Cheers. Freddie, Freddie, you were depressed after qualifying because you had the wrong tyres, whatever excuse you had for the morning. But from 15th on the grid to uh, second overall, you must be pretty chuffed with that. I'm pretty happy with that. Yeah, I had some pretty good racing along the way. Luckily, first couple of laps, I made a lot of places. So uh, gutted that we didn't catch Jeff in the end. But a very good race. I'm happy with that. And it makes up for my atrocious qualifying. All right, we'll see you. Good luck in the next round. Thank you. Charlie Lower. You've only won a sprint before today. Now you've won a proper race. How does that feel? Oh, unbelievable. I did not expect that. Especially to be battling the lead with Jeff halfway round. That was amazing. It was so good. It was great to show that, you know, the top of the white group, top of the green group are very much on par now. But uh, Jeff got away. How did that happen? Did you see what went wrong? Or did you all have a bit of a battle let him go? Uh, it was just me and Jeff at the front for a, a long time. And I, I uh, just overcooked it. Just overcooked it. I'm getting greedy. I thought I'll, I'd get on him, but couldn't, couldn't get there. There were a couple of positives. I got the third fastest lap overall behind the race winner in second place, and I had another good fun hack through the pack. But of course, it was hugely disappointing to be taken out for the second race running. These things happen in racing, and there's absolutely no hard feelings towards the slightly over-enthusiastic Gareth, who was penalised by the stewards with points on his licence and a five-place grid penalty for the next race at Brands Hatch, where I hope to break my elusive search for a podium.